start. There we go. They say we are recording now. This is unit four, and it's psychoacoustics. And I'm going to share screen, and uh, we'll take a look at what I've got here on the old laptop. This is a totally different scene from what we've been seeing so far. Completely and totally different. We're not studying sound waves anymore. We're not talking frequency anymore. All of that stuff is prior to the midterm exam. That's all the first half of the course. What we are focusing on here is psychoacoustics. And I, you can see the notes that you have. This is what I'm going to be talking from as well. And don't let the notes freak you out. They're written kind of weirdly, but I'm going to keep it all in plain English so it makes sense to everybody. I'll put on my glasses so I can see because I'm just about blind when I can't see things close up. Psychoacoustics, and just read what it says on the top there. Threshold concepts, threshold methods, threshold types, stop there. Threshold is the level it takes for you to just barely hear on a hearing test. And when you're getting a hearing test, various pure tone frequencies are presented, right ear, left ear, at various decibels of intensity, which is why we studied frequency, which is why we studied the intensity. And we're trying to find the softest level it takes for you to just barely hear. And that's called your threshold. Your threshold. What's your threshold for 1,000 hertz? Oh, 30 dB. Oh, means it took you 30 decibels to just barely hear 1,000 hertz. What's your threshold at 2,000 hertz? And once again, the test is done to reveal an audiogram showing your hearing thresholds across the frequencies. Later on, like next week, we'll look at DB references, as it says at the top of your page here. Binaural hearing, which means, why do we have two ears? What does two ears do compared to one? And the readings in this for this whole unit here are Wood, Lassford and, Lass and Woodford chapter 5 and chapter 8. We're going to be on this unit for at least two weeks, maybe even three. So this first unit, unit four, is a very important unit, and it goes over a lot of stuff, but please be aware, it's totally different from the stuff you looked at in the first half of the course. The first half was acoustics. This half is psychoacoustics. The first half was like physics. The second half is your perceptions. Read with me here. Psychoacoustics, it says, is a marriage between physical acoustics and the anatomy that gets it, that psychologically perceives it. And then you'll see a weird, it just means sound hitting you. And does, you, does your perception of sound completely mirror reality? Like if you look at this next line here, it says sensations are rarely linear functions of physical stimulus values. In English it means, if you raise the intensity by 10 dB, does it really get louder to you by exactly that amount? Think about it. If I raise the intensity by 10 dB, does your, are your perceptions a perfect match for what took place in the science or in the physics? Here's another one. If you double the frequency, this line right here where it's gray, if you double the frequency from 1,000 hertz to 2,000 hertz. Is your perception of that doubling exactly the same? Or is your perception going to go, oh, when you doubled the frequency, yeah, it got higher in pitch, all right. But did it exactly double? Hmm, kind of hard to say. Let's draw something out right here. And I'll now stop sharing and make it, you all have to look right here with the three of us. Intensity is perceived as loudness. The word loudness is the lay term, the usual common person sidewalk term for intensity, which is measured by the scientist. Okay? Pitch. 
is what the music teacher says in, in music class. Oh, you've got perfect pitch. Oh, isn't that lovely? Pitch is your perception of frequency. See that? So intensity and frequency are science. Loudness and pitch are perceptions. So always make a line between the two. Yeah, to most people, intensity and loudness means the same thing. But in our field, intensity is acoustics and loudness is psychoacoustics. Frequency is acoustics, pitch is psychoacoustics. And we really don't have much for the third dimension of sound, duration. Remember, we said sound takes place over the three dimensions, frequency, intensity, and time. Time hasn't really got one. Time is kind of like, well, time is on the acoustic side. I guess duration, I don't know, whatever on the physics side. But it's mainly intensity and frequency where we differ there. I'll share screen again, and we'll look at something really wild here. We'll move down the page here. Psychoacoustics is, involves hearing sensations. The ears, these are not so neatly divided. We've already discussed that. Main physical correlate of pitch is frequency, but pitch also depends a little bit on this, this frequency here should read intensity and duration too. Okay, whatever, I'm just repeating things. Now look at the next heading. Hearing threshold, and then you'll see this word, weird word called theta. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, theta is a weird Greek letter for TH. That's why they say theta. And theta, I'll stop sharing screen again here. Theta looks like this on the top of the page here. A circle with a line through it. That word mean, or that sign means threshold. So it's just a shorthand way of saying threshold. What was your threshold at 1,000 hertz? What was your threshold at 500 hertz, etc. Okay, back to share screen again here and to the notes, and then you're going to see theta signal, the hearing threshold is a statistical concept involving signal to noise. Oh, God. Let me put that in English again. Every time you're trying to listen to a sound under a headphone, you're trying to listen to something really soft, and that really soft takes a lot of effort. If it's loud, it's easy to hear. But when it's made really soft, eh, your whole face changes. You're listening really hard, and you're always competing with noise. You're listening for the signal, and that's why I grade this out here. Look what it says. Statistical concept involving signal versus noise. Chapter 5, Lass and Woodford. Let me always describe this, and I'll stop sharing again so I can really bring this home. If we are listening to a soft sound, you really have to compete against noise. The noise might be the digesting of your breakfast. Maybe you burped. Maybe you've got a ringing in your ear. Maybe there's a bit of background noise in the room. Maybe the noise is also your own personal crap that you're bringing. Maybe you didn't want to be at the test. Maybe your wife dragged your butt over there. And the guy's going, I don't want to be here. And he's going to have a bias. He's going to have a bit of anger, a bit of his own fear. And he's going to answer differently. And the way he's going to answer is very different from the first grade teacher who's 66 years old and she's just retired with her little white gloves and her purse on her lap. And she's going to be eager to pass the test because she knows that you, you want to pass the test. And so she's going to be raising her hand all the time, even when she's not hearing anything. She's just, she's like a kite in the wind. She's like, and you got to get Mrs. McGillicuddy to go, hey, slow down. Just raise your hand when you're sure. Herb, the farmer who didn't want to be there, he's waiting till it's darn good and loud before he's raising his hand, and he's going to be going. Yeah. 
He's got a whole different attitude. He might even be doing this. I mean, he's just, he's, he's, he's coming at the test with a different brain. So he's going to answer differently. And those are called biases. Bias. Write this down, or you'll see it in your notes later. Actually, it's in the middle of your page, and we'll go there right now. We'll just look at that. Bias is the difference. Look right, right in the middle of your page. Bias affects threshold. It's the difference between what you can answer and what you do answer. It's the difference between what you truly hear versus what you say you hear. And there's all kinds of crap that comes in the middle. And that's bias. And that's noise. That's a different kind of noise. That's like a symbolic type of noise. So noise can be physical competition, trying to hear the sound when there's background noise. But noise is also the, the junk you bring into it. And all of these things affect your threshold. If you look just above it, <coughs> you'll see something called absolute threshold. Circle that word. Absolute threshold is what we're doing in a hearing test. Absolute threshold means, did you hear it or did you not? When you hot, you hot. When you not, you not. Did you hear it or did you not? It's, that's what we do as an HIS in a hearing test with your client. You're testing their hearing thresholds. What kind of thresholds? Absolute threshold. What does that mean? Did they hear it or did they not? That's different from differential threshold. Think of differential threshold as what we'll cover next week. Differential threshold means, let's say you already hear the sound. You're, you're hearing a thousand hertz. But how much change do I make to a thousand hertz for you to notice that there's a change? If I make it a thousand and one hertz, did you hear the difference? How big was the difference for you to notice that there was a difference? It's not, did you hear it or did you not? I'm presenting it to you so you can hear it. Now I'm making a change to what you can hear. And how big was that change required for you to notice that there was a change. See, that's a different kind of threshold. That's called differential threshold. And we don't do that in our field. Just thought I'd tell you, okay? We talk about absolute threshold. So read what it says here. The smallest value, e.g. intensity, that a listener can detect. For example, the presence versus the absence of a signal. Now, I'm not sure if you hear a telephone ringing in the other room. I hear a phone ringing in my kitchen, but I gotta, I, I, I'm just in a lecture here, so I'm just going to let it ring. Okay, just ring away, go nuts, phone. Talk to you later. Anyway, so look what it says here. Softest level required for a person to report that he or she heard a sound. Routine audiometry. That's absolute threshold. The main type of threshold we do. Now let's have fun here and look at this picture that I'm going to show you. Do you see that picture? It's got four boxes on it. And it says, tone at 50 dB sound pressure level. Pretend the subject has perfectly normal hearing. And the person is hearing a tone at 50 dB. SPL. Now, the person, if the tone is present, the person can say yes, or the person can say no. The tone is absent, the person can say yes, he heard it, or the person can say no. So let's say, for example, there's going to be a hundred times, I'm going to, a hundred trials, and in 50 of those trials, I'm going to present the tone at 50 dB. And in 50 of those trials, I'm not going to present the tone at all. And the guy is going to, his job is, did I hear it or did I not hear it? Raise a hand or put your hand down. But the tone is always at 50. I'll say it again. There's going to be a hundred times under the, under the guy's right ear, let's say. I'm going to present the tone at 50 dB SPL. Half the time, the tone will be present. 
half the time the tone will be absent. The job for the client is to say yup or no. Well, guess what? Every time he, the tone is presented at 50, tone, he's going to say yes. And every time the tone is absent, he's going to say no. Look where my arrow went. He's going to have true positives. He's going to say yep when I heard it. And he's always going to say nope when the tone is absent. So all of his answers are going to be in the top left and the bottom right. We call that true positive and true negative. TP, TN. TN sounds like Tennessee. Anyway, <clears throat> getting over a nasty cold I picked up in Minnesota one time. Anyway, so now let's go to the next slide. Check this one out. I have a question. Go for it. So when somebody's having a hearing test and they answer uh, the prompts correctly, like they hear it or they don't hear it, yep. can, can you tell by um, a hearing test if someone has um, above average hearing yep. or no? Yes, you can. You can. You can tell because like the audiogram, which I'll show you later on, goes to minus 10. And some people can hear at minus 10 dB. Those are, that's called better than average hearing. My Look. son had a test recently. Uh huh. He's about seven. And he had uh, tubes placed in his ears when he was two. Yeah. But the way he says things, I'm thinking, is there scar tissue? Now that I'm taking this course, I'm trying to figure out why are you saying things like um, magazine instead of magazine? Like he's using substitute letters. And I'm wondering, is he not hearing them? But when I took him for the hearing test, I, I mean, they said he had higher than normal hearing. So I don't understand why he's doing that. You know what would be a real good idea, Nisha, is, is get a copy of his hearing test. Oh, got it. Next okay. time you ever have your son get in a hearing test, you ask for a copy of it. Got it. Okay. And take that to an audiologist or an HIS and say, explain this to me. Well, he actually saw the doctor who did the surgery on him. Yeah. Yeah, he saw him. That's good. That's yeah. good. It may, be, it may very well mean that his hearing is normal. His learning process for language has some kind of a delay. That may be another yeah. issue, but it's good you got a hearing test done on him because too many teachers and too many caregivers don't end up doing that and they omit yeah. the obvious, you know, and it's yeah. hearing loss and then they, they think it's brain, you know, and it's yeah. not. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thank now you. let's go to this slide right here. Now this, only one word has changed. The 50 is now 5. Here you are at 50. Now the tone is always 5 dB. Once again, 100 trials. 50 of those, the tone will be presented. 50, 50 of those, the tone will not be presented. The client's job is to say, did I hear it or did I not? Just like on the previous slide. And I'm going to be making the tones random. In one trial, the tone may very well be presented. In the next trial, the tone may very well be presented. Maybe it won't. That's up to me, but I have to, in 50% of the 100 trials, the tone will be presented. And at 50% of those 100 trials, the tone will not be presented. But remember, remember, it, the tone is going to be only 5 dB. Real soft. Well, how now? Let's look at the person's face now. He's got normal hearing, and the tone is only five. He's going to be squinting with Clint Eastwood. He's going to be like, I think. Next trial. Maybe. It's the whole face is going to change. His, his whole look on his face is going to be earnestly like, and that is what your client is doing in a hearing test. 
first the tones, you're presenting them at 70, no problem. Then you're presenting them at 60, no problem. Down to 50, no problem. Down to 40, and the softer it gets, the harder it is to hear, and the more room there is for bias to enter the picture. So when the tone is near your true hearing threshold, that's when the shit hits the fan. That's when the crap comes in. That's when the noise interferes with the listening to the signal. Now, Houston, we've got a problem here. We've got to listen hard. And when you think of elderly people, you have to have the heart to notice and the brains to do something about that. Be patient, be kind, and just make yourself friendly and say, what I'm trying to do is we want to find the softest thing that you can hear. So when you're not sure, you just guess. But just... So bias, let's look at, so, so that slide, what I'm trying to show you here, if we go back to that slide, now where will the person's answers lie when the tone is five? Sometimes when the tone is present, he's going to correctly say yes. Sometimes when the tone is absent, though, he might guess and Eh, wrong, but oh well, doesn't mean you're not a nice person. Sometimes when the tone is absent, he will keep his hand down because it won't be there. But sometimes when the tone is absent, he's going to be guessing. He's going to say, yes, there's an abs there's a wrong answer. Look at this bottom left box. Sometimes when the tone is present, he may not think it's there. He he'll keep his hand down. Eh, another wrong. So what goes in these boxes here? If the tone is present and he does hear it, true positive. If the tone is absent and he truly does not raise his hand, true negative. Top right box. If the tone is absent and he's guessing, false positive, FP. If the tone is present and he keeps his hand down, False negative. So true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. And as you get down toward your true hearing threshold, the incidence of these errors is going to increase. The answers will not be nicely in the top left and in the bottom right. They're going to be all over the page here. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Look at another picture here. There's another, sh uh, sometimes this PowerPoint just gets weird. <clears throat> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to advance my slide here and it's, it's holding up. That's what Zoom does once in a while. Ah, here we go. Ah, good. This is another way to look at things. And when you're looking at, look at the bottom left. This is kind of, you'll see a, a bell curve. Think of that like a teacher grading a class. A's, where my, where my pointer is, B's, C's, and D's. That's the grade. And this vertical axis is how many students got A's? How many students got B's? How many students got C's? And how many students got D's? Remember that? That's just a curve. It's called a distribution. So when, when you're talking about a teacher and her grades or his grades from the students in the class, that's the bell curve. We'll call that the bell curve of grades. The horizontal is the grades, A, B, C, or D, and the vertical is the number of students, and then you're plotting how many got what. Okay, now let's talk about psychoacoustics. If the tone is absent, your hair cells in your inner ear, they're alive. They're always tingling a little bit. Okay, they're always, because you're living, your, your cells are alive and there's always a bit of action going on in the nervous system inside your inner ear, even in the absence of the tone. So, look at this bottom left. Call this tone absent. So, this left one here is tone absent. 
And then how many, what, how much, the vertical axis is how much neural excitement, how much neural excitement is taking place. So when the tone is absent, how much neural excitement is taking place? If you look at the right one, think of that as the tone at 50 dB. So this one now is the tone is present at how much? 50 decibels. Well, look at that. You got a whole lot. So the tone is more intense. <coughs> Actually, so yeah. So and now look at here. This, this horizontal axis is the amount of sensation. I, see, I think, you know what, I told you wrong. Let's look at the horizontal axis here is how much neural excitement there is. How much neural excitement there is. That's really what it is. Okay? That's the horizontal. How much neural excitement. And the, the, the vertical is... How many times? Just like the, the students. How many students? This is what percent? How many, how, how many times did that take place? How many times did that neural excitement take place? So the left distribution here is tone is absent. And when the tone is absent, guess what? Not much neural excitement took place. When the tone was present on the dotted curve, lots more neural excitement took place. And notice how there's no overlap. The two are separate. That means the task was easy peasy Japanesey. No problem. When the tone gets softer, look at the middle one. Now, when the tone is absent, the left one is always the absent, okay? There was not much neural excitement, just like before. And when the soft tone, maybe we'll call this 25 dB or 20 or something, you know, when the tone was present, there was more neural excitement, but there was a wee little bit overlap where the person might give false positives or false negatives. And look at the top one. The top one, notice I left the absent one in the very same place. When the tone is absent, not much sensation, not much neural excitement. When the tone was present at five decibels, yeah, there was a little bit more neural excitement, but not much more. There was boo room for error. Look at the overlap. That's where the false positives and false negatives live. So the purpose of this picture is just to talk about this picture and that one in another way. That's all I'm doing is just painting this picture and this picture with a different brush. Same concept. Now let's read our notes about bias. When the tone is soft, you've got a subject bias. Maybe the person's faking a hearing loss. Maybe the person's like Herb, the farmer, who didn't want to be there. He doesn't want to be anyone's fool. He doesn't want to be caught guessing. He doesn't want to make a mistake. So he's waiting until he's sure he hears the tone. Then he's raising a hand. Mrs. McGillicuddy, the teacher with her white gloves on and her purse on her lap, the first grade retired elementary school teacher, her attitude is she's going to be giving a lot of false positives. She's guessing. She's like the Las Vegas gambler. She's pulling that one arm bandit for all she's worth. She's guessing. You see what? So she's going to raise her hand lots of times when there's no tone present. Herb, the angry farmer, he's going to have the opposite. He's waiting until he's sure he hears the tone. So he's going to have lots of false negatives. The tone will be present maybe, but he's no one's fool. He's not going to answer that until he's darn sure he hears it. Then he'll raise his hand. And then he'll raise it like 
You know, he's coming at it from a different side. So his bias is toward false negatives. Mrs. McGillicuddy's bias is to false positives. What does that mean in English? That means, that means that Mrs. McGillicuddy's thresholds are going to look better than they really are. And Herb, his thresholds are going to look worse than they really are. And it's our job as HIS clinicians to tease out the bias. We've got to pull Herb into the center. We've got to pull Mrs. McGillicuddy into the center. we got to get them to the truth. We'll just put it another way. Herb is far to the right politically. Mrs. McGillicuddy, she's gone so far left, she's left America. we got to get them to the center, okay? It's basically, I don't know how else to say it, but that's the, this field has an art and a science to it. The science is you have to know what sound is and the decibel and frequency. The art is the humanity. You've got a person there with a heart and a soul. And so they come to your test with different attitudes. And your job is to get the truth. What do you really hear? So that I can do a better fitting of the hearing aid. So I can program the hearing aid to match your true hearing thresholds and not some BS that's not real. Okay, now let's work our way down the page and we'll talk about how we get around bias because it's kind of cool. When you look at another aspects of bias, so that's the subject bias, look at number two, examiner bias. Experience, instructions, criteria. Look at this. If I say, if I, if I, basically, do you know what you're doing? Do you know how to operate the audiometer? If you, if you don't, you're going to get a lousy test. Here's another one. The instruction biases. Raise your hand whenever you hear the tone, okay? And then shut the door and you put the, or put the headphones on and you shut the door. How do you think that guy's going to respond to? Raise your hand whenever you hear the tone, okay? All right. As opposed to, I'm going to give you tones in your right ear. They're going to get softer and softer and softer. What I want you to do is let me know every time you hear a tone, even if they're very soft or faint, because we want to find out the softest thing you can hear, okay? All right. Let's go. Now, which one's going to give you the best Hearing test, the latter instruct, yeah, because you, you instructed carefully and you told the person what the job was to be done instead of raise your hand when you hear a tone. If you raise the hand when you hear a tone, well, I don't know, the guys may think, well, I'm not sure if I heard a tone there, but whatever, I don't know, I'll wait till I hear it louder. You're going to get the herb test, you're going to get the, the wrong test. So then, then again, so now let's look at the, at the bias types again. So we've got subject bias. You've got experimenter bias. You've got a language barrier. Look at number three. What if the person just moved in from China? What the heck? Oh, he was a Muslim. Trump wouldn't let him in. No, I'm just teasing. So, <clears throat> so what if the person came from another country? And he or she is, has English as a second language. Or maybe it's the person's mother or father who has no English. And the son or daughter is translating from you to the parent. So you're going to be saying to the, to the, to the client, have your mom raise her hand whenever she hears a tone. I'm going to make the tones. And then to so the guy, I'm going to make the tones very soft or faint. Tell her that. What I want you to do now is raise your hand, even if you hear them very soft or faintly. The reason why is because we want to find the softest you can possibly hear. Okay? Okay. Now, when you tell a story to your neighbor sitting at the table, 
And that person tells a story to the next person at the table. And so on. By the time you get around back to you, that story's changed. Okay? Language barrier is only one of those steps around the table. But things get lost in translation. And in today's world, we've got a whole lot more languages spoken than just English. And so language barrier is something else that will affect bias. There's all, see, these are, this is the noise that comes in. Another one is stimulus parameters. You've got to hold that tone bar down for a second. I mean, you can't just go, blip. You have to hold it down long enough for the person's nervous system to get a grip of it. Environmental. Keep the background noise down. Now, that, now we're talking the physical noise instead of just the mental crap. And so is number six, your equipment. Is the room dead and quiet? And is your audiometer calibrated? Is 5 dB SPL really 5? Is, it, is, is, it, is 5 really 5? Is 10 really 10? Every year you get your audiometer calibrated. People come around and do this for you. They come to your office and they calibrate. You will learn more about that in audiometry class. Anyway, let's look, cut to the chase here and talk about how we get around bias because we have a trick. And guess where it was discovered? At the Wisconsin State Fair in 1955. Don't ask me. It's the year I was born. Somewhere in the state of Wisconsin, people were selling hearing aids at a state fair, and people figured out the best way to get around crap. And it's what we do in clinic. First of all, it's called method of limits. And you'll see that on your page there. Method of limits. Okay, read about the bottom quarter of your page. I'm going to just stick to our faces here so I can explain this really well. Method of limits means the, the clinician is doing the adjustments. The client is answering the call. I'm adjusting the intensity. You are raising your hand if you hear it. That's different from method of adjustment, where I'm turning up the volume, and I'm letting myself know when I hear it or don't hear it. That's like a self-hearing a self test, okay? If you're doing a selfie, that's method of adjustment. If a, the client is being in a room on the other side of a glass wall, and the clinician is presenting the tones over the headphone, that's method of limits. Method of limits has a second thing to it as well. Method of limits means I'm adjusting in certain dB steps. Am I adjusting in 10 dB steps? Am I adjusting in 5 dB steps? Or am I adjusting in 1 dB step? Let's say, for example, am I turning it from 50 to 55 to 65? Or am I turning it from 50 to 60 to 70? What's the steps that I'm using? Or am I using a fine tooth comb? 50, 51, 52, 53, okay? But either way, method of limits incorporates specific dB steps. And we use five dB steps in our field. We also use 10 dB steps. And we use a combination of those to get your hearing threshold. And I'll let you know what we do. Here's what they do. They'll test someone at 50, let's say, for example, right ear, headphone, 50 dB. Did you hear it? Yep. Okay. Now I'm going to go down 10. I'm descending by 10. Now I'm hitting at 40. Did you hear it? Yep. Now I'm going to go down by 10 again to 30. Did you hear it? Nope. Hmm. If I didn't hear it at 30, I'm going to go up by 5. So now I'm at 35. Did the guy hear it? Yep. If he heard it, down by 10. 
So 35 minus 10, 25. The guy doesn't hear it. What do you do next? Go up by five to 30. Doesn't hear it. Go up by five to 35. Yep, he hears it. That's his threshold. <coughs> Excuse me. Down by 10. When he, when he hears it, down by 10. If he doesn't hear it, up by five. Two ascending thresholds at the same dB level is threshold. So that's the, and that's called the Hewson, H-U-G-H, Hewson, H-U-G-H-S-O-N, Hewson dash Westlake, Hewson Westlake procedure. That's what we use as HISs. And the Houston Westlake procedure is a variation on the method of limits. Method of limits we discussed, clinician is adjusting, and the clinician is adjusting by fixed amounts. Okay, how are we going to apply method of limits? The Houston Westlake procedure, the ascending, descending procedure. One question. Go ahead. Um, that you said two ascending or two descending. Two ascending, and I'll give. We'll do it again. We'll for sure show show this to you again. Okay. We call it the Houston Westlake ascending descending procedure. And now, when you think about it, how, here's how it gets around bias. If I sat there, if I put headphones on you, and I asked you to raise your hand whenever you heard a tone, and I was simply going down either in 10 or 5 dB steps, who cares? 50, you hear it. 45, you hear it, or 40, whatever. Down, 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 till you don't hear it. And if I marked that as threshold, what if I do purely ascending, where you don't hear it at all, and I'm going up until you do hear it? That's going to be different. Your threshold's good because you don't know what to listen for. You see what I'm saying? If I'm just ascending, you don't know what to listen for. Whereas if I'm descending, you've already heard it. So now you're listening for it again. See what I'm saying? So a descending threshold is going to be better than an ascending threshold. So Houston Westlake ties the two together. Yeah, here, let's take another example. We'll just we'll work at another example here. Tone is presented at 60. The guy hears it. Tones presented at how, what do you what 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 do you what do you present the tone at next? Person heard it at sixty. What comes next? Fifty. Correct. Presented at fifty. The guy hears it. What do you do next? Forty. Forty. The guy doesn't hear it. What do you do next? Up by, up by five. five. Forty-five. Four. He hears it. What do you do next? Up. Uh, no. Uh, no. Oh. Down by ten. Down by 10. Okay. Every yeah. time he hears it, down by 10. So now you're at 35. Okay? Doesn't hear it. You're going up. Doesn't hear it. You're going up. He hears it. Boom. Five, okay. Two ascending responses at the same decibel level is threshold. And that's the way. And you're doing that for 1,000 hertz, 2,000 hertz, 4, 8, and then you go down to 125, 250, and 500. Now you've got all seven octave frequencies. And the, what you're doing here, and I'll show it to you on an audiogram. This is an audiogram, and I'll just show you a picture of it so you see it. We'll get out of this boring picture. Let's go to, okay, we'll scroll down just a trifle. Here you go. There's an audiogram. Here you go. Audiogram, we'll make it big. There it is. So look at your frequencies along the top. You're testing at 1,000 hertz, 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, and then you're testing at 125, 250, and 5. So you're testing at seven different octave frequencies. What are octaves? When you double the frequency, you go up one octave. 125 is low C on a piano in music. 250, middle C. 500, high C. So you can see that music is generally in the lower half range. 1,000 hertz, double high C, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
So the sounds of speech, the letters S, TH, CH, CH, the letter F, F, the letter K, K, those are all high pitched sounds. And they're very soft, soft. Whereas vowels are louder, they're around 50 to 60, and they're generally in the low half. Put your hand to your throat. E, I, A, O, U. Those are the loudest and the lowest parts of speech. Whereas consonants are high up in frequency and they're softer. So speech, if I was to draw the letters of speech across your audiogram, they would go like my cursor. The vowels would all be here, and then, and then you'd start getting your high frequency consonants here. And elderly people have high-pitched hearing loss. Look at my arrow. Elderly people will hear 125 at 10, no problem. They'll hear 250 maybe at, I don't know, about 15, 20. They'll hear 500 at around 25, 35. And as you go higher up in pitch, their thresholds will get worse and worse and worse. In other words, these are your decibels. More and more decibels are required for the person to just barely hear. Okay? So they, the person will have what's called a sloping audiogram. It'll do, go down like a hill. And yet, the letters of speech are going the opposite way. The, he, so he can hear the vowels. He won't hear the consonants. So he's going to say, you young kids mumble. You're always mumbling all the time. Did they speak up? Learn your diction. Where did you learn how to talk? It's kind of like, well, a lot of young people do mumble. But that coin has two sides. The other side is you've got trouble hearing treble. You've got aging hearing loss. It's called presbycusis. Sounds just like Presbyterian. Well, Presbyterian is Church of the Elders. Presbyopia, your arms aren't long enough to read the page. That's why I wear these, because I'm past 40. Presbycusis, hits you when you're 65. Can't hear treble. Trouble with treble. And what are you going to say? I can hear. You don't need to shout at me. I just can't hear what you said. Did you say sat or cat? Good. All right. So we'll go now to the bottom of your page here. Looking at your notes, clinical audiometry uses method of limits to get around bias in finding absolute threshold. The advantage is it's fast. But you remember, you're always going to get your client guessing, saying yes all the time, like the Las Vegas gambler, Mrs. McGillicuddy, or you're going to get Herb, the farmer, the chicken, who only raises his hand when the tone is good and loud. And the way to best get around a bias like that is the Houston Westlake ascending, descending approach, as you see here on the screen. It makes the person lose orientation and respond to the best of ability. <coughs> Excuse me, start at some decibel level that's audible, go down by 10 dB steps, See whether there's a response. If yes, keep dropping until no response. Then go up by 5 dB steps until a response is found. Once that, go down by 10 dB from that level until no response. Then rise up once again in 5 dB steps. Audiometric threshold is the dB level where you found two ascending responses and you should add after that at the same db level got it cool we've just covered a goodly amount of psychoacoustics this morning and we're going to just finish off with this little guy right at the top anybody got any questions so far probably do but it'll come to you later and you go why didn't i ask then that's typical we're going to cover the top half we've only got about five minutes we won't play, play very long at this because what we'll do is we'll pick up right here again next week, okay? But I'm going to throw it out 
right now. And then that way, next week, you'll say, oh, yeah, I watched that movie before. I heard that crap before. Okay, now I'll, I'll, watch, I'll hear it a second time, and I'll get it a little bit better. All right, here we go. If we look at share screen and we take a peek, a peek at this here, frequency and intensity of a sound and how these affect threshold, you'll see something called MAF. Now, let's talk about it instead of, or let's sit, take a picture of it. Let's look at it in terms of pictures. Here you go. Now, this is a picture showing you, I'm showing you a curve. Well, yeah, and by the way, this picture is talking about the Houston-Westlake ascending procedure. It just gives you a, a flow chart, okay? Anyway, that's just what that slide is. This one here, you'll see this big weird curve going down. And the bottom reads frequency from really low on the left to really high on the right. And read what that says. The circles show the amplitude of vibration of the eardrum at threshold, at, where, at the level that the guy could just barely hear. The curve represents the calculated amplitude of the air molecules in a sound wave at threshold pressure, meaning how much did the atoms push against the eardrum? when you were trying to just barely hear, where the ear is most sensitive, right at the bottom here, the, the amplitude of vibration of the eardrum is less than the diameter of a frickin' hydrogen molecule. This means <coughs> where we best hear, look at this, right between 1,000 and 5,000 hertz. Our hearing is actually best at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 500, 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000. That's really the best range of our hearing. It's because of the resonances of our ears, the resonance of your outer ear canal as a quarter wave resonance that we talked about previously. It's also due to the resonance of your middle ear, but the point I want to point, get to look at is, notice how you've got a curve. In other words, when you go lower in frequency, more intensity is required for you to just barely hear. And if you go still lower, more is in quite required for you to just barely hear. Here, researchers played around with this after Second World War. How many of them? A whole bunch of them. They all did studies of this. And what they did was they said, they placed a person just like we talked about in the decibel, one meter distance from a speaker so that the guy could hear with two ears. And they tested at a thousand hertz, the level required for the person to just barely hear. And then at 2,000 hertz, the level required for a person to just barely hear, and so on, and so on. And then they went lower in frequency. And again, they found this lopsided smile. All the different researchers, to greater or lesser degrees, but they all found this weird curve, just like this curve here. And then later studies. So now look at the bottom. Don't worry about the top two. Just look at the bottom. We'll take it home to us. It's called minimal audible field. And it kind of relates to what we talked about when we talked about the decibel. We said, what is zero dB SPL? And we defined zero as the softest it took to hear a 1,000 hertz tone at one meter distance with two ears. Remember that? Cover that very specifically in unit two. What is zero dBSPL? The softest pressure it took to just barely hear a 1000 hertz tone at one meter distance with two ears. And we'll call that, now look at my cursor. We'll call that zero dBSPL. Okay, now let's play that same game at 2,000 hertz. One meter distance, listening from a speaker with two ears, okay, it took a little bit less 
less. And what was that pressure? Do you recall what that pressure was for zero at a thousand hertz? It was 0 0.0002 dynes per centimeter squared. Remember that? That was the softest pressure required for you to just barely hear 1000 hertz tone at one meter distance with two ears. And we called that zero dB SPL. Good. Now we're playing the game at 2000 hertz. What's the softest it took? And guess what? Even less pressure at 2000 hertz. In other words, your ears are more better at 2000 hertz than they are at one. So guess what? It, the person can hear 2000 hertz in that listening situation at even less than zero. See? So never think of zero dB SPL as the absence of sound. It isn't. It's the softest it takes to hear a 1,000 hertz tone at one meter distance with two ears. Okay? I didn't make this crap up. That's what they did. So they had to call the ground something. If you want to say the apartment is twice as high as the house, you have to know where the ground is. So let's define the ground, and that ground is 0 dB. SPL. And what is zero dB SPL? The softest pressure it took for a normal hearing human to hear a 1000 hertz tone at one meter distance with two ears. Okay. Now we play that at 4000 hertz. Guess what? The guy's hearing gets even better. And then at five, and then at eight and 10, and the hearing gets a little worse again. And then let's go lower. Ooh, look at this. At 50 hertz, we can't even hear the tone at 50 hertz until it's darn near 60 dB SPL. Okay? So our hearing is uneven across the frequencies. We have better hearing at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John than we do at the lows or higher frequencies. And that's due to the resonances of the outer and the middle ears. Okay? Look at the next picture. You'll see M A P. This is a, shows a similar curve. It's shorter though, isn't it? It's not quite as doesn't go out as far as this bottom one. Leave the top two alone. We won't even discuss them this week. But notice how the next curve. It's it's similar in shape from about here to here. But it's also a little bit elevated. It's a little bit higher. Look, see how the bottom one touched the ground there. Look at this next one. It doesn't. This represents hearing with one ear under a headphone, just like we do in audiometry. One ear under a headphone. So we're going from 125 hertz to 250 to 500 to 1,000 to 2 to 4 to 8, and then they continue way past up 10. God knows why they did that, but who cares? The point is, even under head phones you've got a little bit of you've got this you have that smile our hearing is best between one to four thousand hertz a little poorer at 500 but it gets worse and worse when you get lower that's called minimal audible pressure is doing that listening game with one ear under a headphone minimal audible field is doing that same game with two ears at one meter distance in front of a speaker. Two ears are better than one. Two ears are better than one. That's why minimal audible field, the curve is further down, minimal audible pressure, it's a little bit up. How much up? About five dB up. Two ears are about five dB better than one ear. So if you are deaf, in one ear. You don't have a 50% hearing loss. Two ears are only about 5% better or 5 dB better than one ear. Okay? The person with one ear, however, won't be able to tell the direction of sound. That person's screwed for, for direction. But his hearing sensitivity in a, in a room is only about 5 dB worse than yours or mine. Okay, now I will close today with this one statement. <clears throat> Are both of you taking 130 audiometry? I am. 
look very carefully at this MAP. Okay. MAP is capital letters, bold faced, italics, underlined. MAP is zero dbhl map is this flat line okay. which means that your audiometer with the headphones it is calibrated so that let's look at 250 we call it zero here guess what that really is in dbspl it's about 30 mm -hmm. I'm not lying Okay, it's about 30 PL. We'll call it zero. So this, you know why we're doing this? So we can get rid of that curve. We don't want that curve. That's normal hearing under a headphone with one ear. But I don't want to deal with differences across the frequency. I want to make it all normal. I want to make it all zero. So I'm going to build these numerical differences into the audiometer so that I can say zero dB H L hearing level or zero dB hearing loss. And that's why these numbers read in dB H L. Whereas these numbers read in dB S P L. You get it? So M A P is normal hearing, but normal hearing is really uneven across the frequencies because of the resonances of our ears. But we don't want to have these differences all across the board when we're doing a hearing test. So I'm going to build in these differences into the audiometer so that the audiogram, I can read zero at the top. But always remember, when you peel off the hair, peel off the picture, this zero actually represents different dBSPLs across the frequency. I'll stop here. It's now here on the Pacific West Coast. It's 1037 by you, Nisha. It's probably by 130, is it? Something like that. Yeah. You've listened long enough. I extend to you my warmest sympathies and thoughts. I really am so pleased and so happy that you always had her there. I, I, would, I would tell my wife, too, I'd say, you're not going to, this is great. And then she knew at me, too. I just <laughs> yeah, she used to talk about you. She said, did you learn anything today? I said, Mom, do you remember what he was saying? And she said, he was saying something about the hearing, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's really precious. I, I, it's, I, if you have any questions, Nisha. I will. I'm going to call you. I'm you gonna call bet. And, and I've taken away your quizzes one and two. Please okay. look at your notes and resubmit it. It's open book, okay? okay? All right. I thought I did better on the second one. Did I do better on the second one? I can't remember. I'd have to okay. look. I can't remember. Okay. I graded them. Okay, and I'm going to go back, but I will have some questions because that first one, I wasn't getting it. You know, yeah. I wasn't getting the numbers uh -huh. on the first one, but well, I'll give you a call. Yeah, do so. When you're looking at that uh, quiz, give me a phone call and I can go through it with you. Okay, thank All you. Right. Cheers. Bye-bye.